Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Marie Rickert will defend the academic thesis, Shaping Participation, Children's and Teachers' Language Practices in Linguistically Diverse Early Childhood Education and Care. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Dear Prorector, members of the committee, family, colleagues, and friends, in the room and also those online. In the next 15 minutes, I will briefly present my dissertation, Shaping Participation, Children's and Teachers' Language Practices in Linguistically Diverse Early Childhood Education and Care. We are gathered today in Maastricht, which you can see on the map, is located in the province in the south of Limburg, the most southern parts of the Netherlands, bordering the Aachen region in northern Westphalia, Germany. Traveling through this region, many different languages and ways of speaking can be heard. The national languages, German and Dutch, but in Limburg, also the regional minority language Limburgish, which is used by about 48% of the inhabitants of Limburg. And of course, there are also many different family languages, which once came here through migration of their speakers, such as Polish, Turkish, or Arabic. Some of these languages have been around for many generations. And being at Maastricht University today, you surely also notice the vitality of globally dominating languages like English. In short, there is linguistic diversity at stake. And linguistic diversity is a quite complex social phenomenon, but somehow people know exactly which languages to use in which situation, even which subtle nuances, and they also know when to switch between languages and different ways of speaking. People navigate this linguistic diverse landscape with sociolinguistic competences, but how do they acquire these sociolinguistic competences? One of the answers to this question lies in early childhood education and care, so kindergartens and preschools, for example. In this defense, I will refer to it with the acronym ECEC. ECEC is important because it is the first institutional setting that children attend, so children get into contact with societally meaningful ways of using language. This process is called language socialization. Children are socialized through the use of language and they are socialized to use language, as defined by Ox and Schifflin. Importantly, children actively take part in this process. They participate. I have analyzed participation in this dissertation following Goodwin's as actions demonstrating forms of involvement by parties within evolving structures of talk. So this could be through words, but also through active listening, which, for example, becomes visible through body postures, orientations and reactions like gestures. In my dissertation, I was interested in participation against the background of the linguistic diversity of the region. Therefore, I researched the overarching question, how do children and teachers arrange participation in linguistically diverse ECEC on both sides of the border? To find this out, I conducted linguistic ethnographic fieldwork. In practice, this meant that I spent a lot of time in two different ECEC centers, one on each side of the border. And for that time, I became part of these centers. I spent four and a half months doing research in preschool Little Sprouts in Limburg. In Little Sprouts, both Limburgish and Dutch were used. About a quarter of the children also had other home languages like Albanian, Spanish or Mandarin. Later, I also spent three months doing research in a kindergarten on the German side of the border called Good Shepherd, it's a pseudonym. At the Good Shepherd, about three quarter of the children speak another language than German or besides German at home and about half of the children exclusively speak their family language when starting kindergarten in German at the age of three. During fieldwork, I conducted participant observation and documented this by note-taking. Conducted audio recordings to analyze interactional trajectories and video recordings to account for the multimodal involvements of children and teachers. This combination made it possible to analyze not only speech, body positioning and gaze, 
but also the material and ideological surrounding of the two ECEC centers. I will now go through the results of the four individual papers that make up my dissertation. In the first study, called You Dutch, Not English, I found language hierarchical orders which rendered national language Dutch powerful, followed by Limburgish, and leaving little to no space for other family languages. These orders are based on so-called language ideologies, which briefly are ideas about languages and how languages should be used. It became clear that in these orders, specific affordances for children's participation emerged relationally. Forms of participation were contingent upon different interaction partners and the interaction format. One example of this was when I played with a child who speaks Albanian at home and also knows some English, but was very reluctant to explore his multilingualism with me. In fact, he first told me that I should speak Dutch, not English. Together in our play, we then jointly reworked the strict language education policy and found ways to integrate multilingual resources into our play. Concretely, this became possible through integrating classical activity formats in the preschool, like counting or initiation response, sequen initiation response feedback sequences. In this study, I worked with the post-humanist notions of intra-relation and relationality, as I laid emphasis on my own and the child's becoming. The second study particularly focused on the dynamics between Limburgish and Dutch. Previous research already indicated that Dutch is the dominant language in ECEC in Limburg and that it is used for group interactions and instruction contexts. Limburgish, in contrast, is reserved for the socio-emotional domain. It is used in run-on-run -run situations, for example, when consoling a child. My study established that this language ideological order also becomes apparent in the ways in which different participation constellations are formed. If teachers create an intimized participation frame, so for example, if they have a quick chat among colleagues in the fruit break in front of the children, they use Limburgish. The children then understand that the chat is not meant for them and they might, for example, initiate other action. When they stage conversations, however, so they pretend to say something to each other which is actually meant for the children to be overheard. They use Dutch for this purpose. For example, they say things seemingly to each other, like, I don't know what we should teach the children anymore. They really know everything about the animals on the farm. These staged conversations take place in Dutch. All children are attentive then, knowing very well that they are being praised. Another practice that turned out very, re very relevant for language socialization ECEC is singing. I heard and sang a lot of songs during fieldwork. Spontaneous singing in interaction is the topic of the third paper. Singing is initiated by the teachers on various occasions throughout the day. There is a song for tidying up, a song to learn the seasons, a song if it's someone's birthday. So singing in ECEC has a wide variety of functions. It can be ritualistic, instructive, a means of knowledge sharing or cultural socialization. Importantly, singing always takes place in Dutch, contributing to the dominance of Dutch in ECEC in Limburg. But outside of this formalized singing, children also engage in non-formalized singing themselves. They use songs to pursue interactional aims. For example, I, being a Dutch a second language speaker myself, once did not know the word for a hedgehog made from chestnut shells. A child used a song to teach me. This is prick, 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 au, 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 egeltje, what do you now? Children thus used songs to transfer knowledge, but also to transform peer play and engage in language cultural socialization. For example, when they began to sing happy birthday when playing with a toy cake and a simple play in the toy kitchen became a birthday celebration. To get an impression of the singing, I would like to share with you an example of two boys whose singing entangles with their playing. They engage in peer socialization and use musical resources to structure the way that they build a tower with building blocks. 
you will be able to hear both the singing and the bedding blocks. Across these three studies, it became clear that linguistic diversity takes shape in ideologically mediated ways in Limburg. Neither teachers nor children, however, usually talk about the linguistic diversity present in their group. This was very different in the German kindergarten, Good Shepherd. Here, children sometimes used a word of their home language or discussed languages with each other and the teachers. For example, a teacher asked a Russian-speaking child for the word mermaid in Russian when she did not know it in German, even though the teacher did not know Russian herself. This action, for example, promoted an ideology that regards translation as a skill. Another child, who was annoyed by the teachers and my monitoring and disturbing his play, proudly shouted out, you don't even know how to say cow in Polish. This comment came completely out of context, but it shows that he refers to his home language as something valuable that makes him special. However, in some interactions, I also observed monolingual tendencies. In general, I found that at Good Shepherd, many language ideologies were at stake simultaneously, resulting in language ideological assemblages. Children had to navigate different, sometimes conflicting language ideologies. The same child who had been asked by the teacher how to say mermaid in Russian, for example, experienced that peers rejected her suggestion that a melon would be called arbus. They only accepted the German melone as valid in the kindergarten context, leaving no room for the idea that the same item can have different names in different languages in the context of the kindergarten. Children navigated these language ideological assemblages by positioning themselves in different ways. For example, this child did actually not know how to say mermaid in Russian and answered that she is still a child. With this, she highlighted that her multilingualism is still developing. In the language ideological conflict about the naming of a melon, she showed bilingual awareness by highlighting that she does not identify as a German-only speaker. With this, I come to the conclusion of my talk. I found that participation in ECEC is a dynamically emergent phenomenon that takes many forms. Children can competently participate, for example, in embodied ways, through singing or through active listening. In both research and educational practice, it is therefore important not to overemphasize speech, but instead acknowledge that participation through language practices is dynamic and multimodal. Secondly, this dissertation advocates for a nuanced approach to linguistic diversity in ECEC. Such an approach acknowledges all languages that children get into contact with, for example, also at home, even if they are not actively used in ECEC. Linguistic diversity is always ideologically mediated and different languages can, for example, be linked to different social meanings. Harmonious bilingual development requires an acknowledgement of a child's full linguistic repertoire. On a methodological note, I suggested in this dissertation that the participation of the ethnographer is central for the research and analysis process. Concretely, I showed that linguistic ethnographers can gain valuable insights when they analyze their involvement in the field through the same methodologies applied to analyze the participation of others. And lastly, research for this dissertation has been conducted across borders. Since ECEC is organized differently in the two national contexts, it was not the purpose to compare the two settings. Rather, seeing how different national and local contexts enable certain phenomena and how these phenomena take shape. The use of the regional minority language resulted in a particular linguistic landscape in the preschool in the Netherlands. Seeing the emerging language hierarchies there directed my own ethnographic sensitivities in the German context. I soon noticed that children and teachers actively discussed their linguistic diversity there, 
but that these instances brought across many different, sometimes conflicting, language ideologies. It became particularly clear that children actively positioned themselves in these language ideological assemblages, something that I noticed since it was different in the Dutch context. This might, of course, also be related to the children's age, as the children were younger in the Dutch preschool than in the German kindergarten. Like this, juxtaposing ethnographic field sites across borders was a fruitful starting point to explore the language dynamics of participation in linguistically diverse ECEC. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the opposition's question. With this, I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. Archie Svinnen, Professor in Aging Studies here at Maastricht University. Thank you so much. Beste kandidaat, I will first say something in Dutch. <laughs> Um, van harte gefeliciteerd met je proefschrift. Je hebt als een van de weinige promovendi klaargespeeld om nog voor het einde van je contract je doctoraat af te ronden en dat terwijl de COVID-19-pandemie je etnografisch onderzoek voor allerlei uitdagingen stelde. Dat is echt heel bijzonder. Net zoals de snelheid waarmee je Nederlands en Limburgs hebt geleerd om de multilinguistische praktijk te bestuderen. De gedetailleerde en creatieve manier waarop je je rijke dataset hebt geanalyseerd is een van de vele kwaliteiten van je werk. En innovatief is ook het prentenboek waarin je enkele casussen hebt verwerkt om impact te creëren. Maar ik ben hier natuurlijk niet alleen om uh, lof te zwaaien, maar ook um, om een aantal vragen te stellen om in dialoog uh, te treden. So my first question. In the conclusion of chapter 6... You advise teachers on how to create a more language-inclusive space by increasing awareness about multilingualism. I wonder whether your advice shouldn't also encourage teachers to learn more about language ideologies and how they intersect with age ideologies. You do not explicitly address age ideology in your PhD, but you do hint at it in the introduction when explaining how in childhood studies, for instance, a children are often described as simultaneously being and becoming. Literacy in terms of language proficiency and age do intersect and have a huge impact on how people are assessed and valued, children included. Age ideology is also beautifully expressed by Inga in transcript 22 that you just referred to yourself. It's my favorite transcript of the whole book. Uh, when she says, uh, ich bin noch Kind, huh? and the teacher replies, uh, ja, du musst das auch nicht wissen. Uh, could you please reflect a bit more on how age ideology and the role it plays in your research? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your compliments and also for your very interesting question that allows me to elaborate a little bit on the intersection of age ideologies and language ideologies. And I do believe that age ideologies are in fact uh, very relevant and very much at stake in the ECEC centers. And they interestingly also intersect with a range of other ideologies such as educational ideologies. Because there's a specific idea about childhood being um, a time of simultaneously being and becoming, as you also mentioned. So the children are children already in their own rights, but they are at the same time also seen as developing and therefore as in need of child-centered actions and in need of uh, certain support with their languages. And this intersects very much with language ideologies which are present in the centers. Um, because these language ideologies are also bringing in a de developmental factor that teachers often think that speaking Limburgish and Dutch or Turkish and Dutch or German at the same time might overwhelm such young children and that mm -hmm. children should therefore <coughs> mainly speak uh, uh, the dominant language. So it is clear that these ideologies, um, especially in the educational context, uh, really intersect and that seeing children as um, yeah, developing in their language abilities, which of course is also true, um, but which does not 
need to mean monolingual tendencies because it is especially important to understand that multilingual development uh, is a normal language development that just takes place in a different way than monolingual development. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the opposition will be uh, continued by Professor Dr. Christina Hoof, uh, Professor of Educational Sciences at the University of Münster. Hmm? Marie, thank you so much for your papers and the overall composition of the papers. And I pointed out in my review that I think to line out a compositional line of what you've been doing in four different papers, which were published in four international journals, is um, to be highly appreciated because it's a complex thing to do that after you published four papers to find like a, a thread going through the papers. And I found that was an impressive, I, I wrote in my reviews a, a good balance between being very systematic and very creative because it demanded both and you find found such a good balance of it. I was envious. <laughs> However, and that's my, um, my question is about the composition of the four papers, and then part two of the question is, what does it mean to work with Barat? In the composition of your four papers, I was irritated by the fact that you use the term of interaction for three papers and the Baradian term of intraaction in your first paper, and I found that Mm, disturbs the red line a bit because it's such a conceptual clash because the red is actually writing against interaction. So um, how do you position yourself to that inconsistency is part one of my question. And part two is, since you work with Barat and make her very dominant in paper one, um, she's so critical of language and meaning making. And um, I brought you a quote. She says that language has been granted too much power and even everything, even materiality, is turned into a matter of language. And I was wondering how does it affect you as a researcher on language to, and meaning-making to work with Barat? Mm -hmm. um. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your compliments as well and for your very interesting question with uh, regards to the relation of interaction and interaction and how i combine the two in my thesis so for the audience i might um, quickly recapitulate what actually interaction interaction what these concepts entail and um, why they might lead to some questions about them being simultaneously used in the same dissertation. So inter, going back yeah, to the Latin prefix, means among or in the midst of, and intra means within. So intra-action that I'm using prominently in chapter three is really about the mutual co-constitution of different entities. So it's about entities which are becoming within the interaction. Interaction, which I use prominently in chapter four, five, and six, uh, as well as also in chapter two it is introduced, um, is actually about the idea that each entity exists before they encounter each other, and then they yeah, relate to each other within this interaction. So in the analysis in my dissertation, actually using these two different concepts enabled different kinds of analysis for me. And I also aimed to contribute to different scholarly discourses. So highly esteemed opponent, you already mentioned that I published these papers also in different academic venues, which also meant that I was addressing different discourses, different audiences, and linking also to different research traditions. 
And I think that using intra-action in chapter three prominently, um, with this I really wanted to contribute to the field of post-humanist and new materialist studies of childhood. Um, and I found it especially important to contribute also with the discussion of language education policy. Because, and this relates to the second part of your question, that is in fact something that is yeah, commonly not at the center of the discussion within this field of studies. However, being a linguistic anthropologist, I really find that language as a social practice is inherently entangled with a lot of other social practices, and I really wanted to foreground this in chapter three. Using intra-action in chapter three also enabled me as an ethnographer to analyze my own becoming in the field. So, in this sense, there was a lot of value of using intra-action within chapter three. However, and now I come more to the concept of interaction and why I use interaction in other chapters, I also link to the scholarly discourse of language socialization very much. And language socialization really has been established within a tradition that yeah, is based actually on the concept of interaction. I work with notions of uh, collaborative action by Goodwin, for example, and notions of competent participation, singing as competent participation. And these concepts and notions very much also yeah, rely on the child as an entity that is taking part in, in a sort of interaction. So this is why the two concepts had different purposes and also addressed different audiences within my dissertation. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Jurgen Jaspers, Professor of Dutch Linguistics at the Université Libre de Brussel. Thank you, Chair. Uh, dear candidate, dear Marie, uh, congratulations. You've produced a uh, competent, very readable, well-organized, detailed account of interactional practices in two linguistically diverse nursery schools in Limburg and Nordrhein-Westfalen. For a lot of uh, reasons that I don't have the time to make explicit now, I do wish to uh, state explicitly that I'm impressed by how you've addressed the ethical challenges that, uh, um, I mean, that you've had to go through by when you've organized your participatory research uh, with young children. Not to mention that I'm impressed by the fact that you've had to carry out your field work during the pandemic. That's really quite a challenge. Uh, so all in all, it wasn't very difficult to decide that this PhD meets the standard of what is required for obtaining uh, a doctoral degree, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we'll discuss that later uh, with the jury. I uh, also have the task to, ask, to act as your uh, opponent, of course. Um, and um, my first question would be this. Um, I have the impression that your PhD displays a tendency of seeing early childhood education and care as an innovative domain to focus on. I can follow that, since this age group was not so often focused on in the social linguistics of uh, education. But the innovation argument only goes so far, uh, I believe. Our lives are descriptively inexhaustible. I'm quite sure that language use at PhD defenses is a totally undescribed phenomenon, um, but that doesn't make it interesting or promising per se as an object for scholarly time and energy. Now, I have the impression, moreover, in your PhD that you see early childhood education and care as a domain which is relatively insulated from primary and secondary education, uh, from primary and secondary school settings. Um, and I say this because you hardly seem to draw connections between nursery schools uh, and primary and secondary schools. You hardly mention research results from these contexts. Now, there are, of course, differences between nursery school context and primary and secondary schools, uh, but also a lot of similarities, as I'm sure you'll agree. And there is a large literature, in fact, on primary and secondary schools, which addresses the agency of children, how children negotiate language policies, and so on. Now, the more you uh, maintain the idea of EC, EC as, a, as an insulated domain, the more you can maintain that it's innovative to focus on this domain. But I wonder if you're not foregoing opportunities to compare between nursery schools on the one side, primary and secondary schools on the, on the other. So was this a deliberate choice to focus on nursery schools as something specific? And I wonder then, what is so specific about nursery schools? If it wasn't deliberate, have you perhaps forgotten opportunities to make comparisons between different school contexts? Yeah. yeah. 
Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your compliments and I would also like to thank you for your very relevant question about how ECEC relates and how I with my dissertation also relate to uh, academic discourses and research about language ideologies in primary schools and secondary schools and um, why I see ECEC as an innovative domain. So it is true that um, yeah, research classically in sociolinguistics, also in linguistic ethnography, has focused more on the context of primary and secondary schools. But I agree with you that this does not make the ECEC context innovative in itself. But I do think it is relevant to say that um, primary and secondary schools are, of course, very connected to the ECEC context because they are a continuation of it. So I mentioned in chapter two that um, ECEC um, is the first setting, is a very in, um, influential setting because it's the first institutional setting that children get in touch with. And of course the first institutional setting then lays the base for a continuation in the secondary school, in the primary school, uh, other way around, <laughs> and also uh, in the university context. So it's really about um, societal language ideologies which are introduced in this context kind of for the first time in an institutional setting, but which are then later on followed up. And it is very interesting to draw connections with primary and secondary school context. So for example, in your own work, uh, where you describe how um, students, uh, pupils, are also very aware of the language ideologies and how they draw on them with linguistic stylization, for example. So these students that uh, you have <laughs> researched yourself, for example, then um, really have been familiarized with these language ideologies they are building upon and uh, drawing upon uh, already starting from the ECEC context. So it really is a continuation. I think in the future it would be very interesting to look into um, yeah, this uh, continuous and this kind of development and trajectories of language ideologies which are um, yeah, acquired. So very interesting suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Franz Hiddink, senior lecturer in teacher-child interaction at the Stenden University of Applied Sciences. Thank you, Chair. Uh, dear candidate, dear Marie, <coughs> congratulations on reaching this significant milestone in your academic journey. Uh, I've read your dissertation with great pleasure and interest. It's uh, extremely well structured and written. And more importantly, your research has contributed valuable knowledge on relevant language practices in multilingual ECEC settings. However, I do have a few topics I would like to discuss, but let me start by the first one. Um, <laughs> I want to focus on the practical implications. Um, in the different chapters, like chapter six, um, and the, in the impact paragraph, uh, you offer some valuable suggestions, uh, primarily focused on the pedagogical and didactic actions of the teacher <coughs> to create a language inclusive atmosphere. However, this emphasis on the actions of the teacher somewhat underrepresents other insights provided by your studies. Your findings throughout the dissertation underscore the competences of children in navigating linguistic diversity through participating in day-to-day -day interactions with professionals and with peers. To my belief, your dissertation can be an inspiration for teachers to understand that peer interaction is an important site among young children as well. <coughs> uh, Blumkulka, for instance, described peer talk as a double opportunity space for children's social and discursive gains, as well as their development of language competences. In my experience, however, teachers at preschool and kindergarten tend to neglect the affordances of peer interaction and mainly focus on stimulating language development in interactions with themselves. This is also demonstrated in research showing that the interaction skill to stimulate and guide children's peer interactions is the most problematic one for professionals in Dutch daycare centers. So, <clears throat> my impression is that with regard to the practical implications, you are too narrowly focused on enhancing the actions of the teacher. Do you, do you agree with my observation? Doesn't your dissertation offer ample opportunities to emphasize the affordances of peer interactions in the context of diversity and ECEC? Could you provide some recommendations for teachers to get a better grip of what is actually happening in peer interactions and how to value 
the discursive practices of young children. Thank you very much, esteemed opponent, for your compliments and also for your interesting and very relevant reflections about the role of peer interaction in ECEC and what this might um, entail for my own recommendations uh, that I base upon my studies. I agree with you that peer interaction is a domain which in research but also in pedagogical practice has been often overlooked and I think that my dissertation, so particularly for example the chapter on singing, chapter five, but also chapter six on the language ideological assemblages really shows how how rich peer interaction um, is in terms of language socialization and what kind of affordances peer interaction offers. So um, I do think that within my outreach, reflecting upon my um, societal outreach that I have, uh, that I have done, I um, actually have engaged with teachers also about this topic of peer interaction. And it uh, turned out to me that they were often surprised, in fact, yeah. about uh, the richness of these peer interactions. And I have contributed to this discourse, for example, with a, a very practical resource, a children's book that I co-created with an illustrator, um, which also um, shows some instances of how children socialize each other. So I have tried to create some awareness also for this topic. And I think it's very relevant, this recommendation also to yeah, keep doing this and maybe also emphasis on this more in my own writing in the future, uh, in instances like I did in the impact paragraph, for example. Um, because it is, in fact, a very, very re relevant uh, topic. And I hope to have shown this also, for example, with the um, yeah, little extract of singing that I, that I uh, made you all listen to today. Um, but I must say, at the same time, ECEC is also a domain where a lot of power dynamics are at stake. So at the same time, uh, I also find it important to really give some practical recommendations to the teachers about their own pedagogical practice, because talking to teachers, I often find that this is really the way that they look at ECEC. So I think it is a good idea to give them a little bit of this, which is also a result of my dissertation, but to also really emphasize the importances that peer interaction holds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Content? Okay, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Lauren Wagner, Associate Professor in Diasporic Mobilities here at Maastricht University. Dear candidate, um, I echo all of my colleagues' um, sentiments in terms of the quality and <clears throat> ambitiousness of your thesis and the uh, impressiveness of having completed it with such thoroughness in such trying times. Um, my question uh, follows up on uh, Professor Hoof's question, but unfortunately you answered quite a lot of it in your answer previously, so um, I've been trying to rework what to ask you, and I think um, maybe what I will do is give you an opportunity to uh, extrapolate further what, um, what contribution your thesis is making to, uh, to um, interdisciplinary discussions connecting ethnography and um, sociolinguistics. Um, so uh, my question comes back to this point about using Barad and interaction and uh, engaging that alongside sociolinguistics as a field where, in, from my perspective, relationality is fundamental to the discipline. Um, that uh, we can't talk about sociolinguistics without thinking relationally. Um, and you know, this is one of the contributions that theories about assemblage and about entanglement have brought into, into other places, but um, it's sort of already there in a way for sociolinguistics. But it seems like from your previous answer that you're thinking about these distinctions a little bit along these lines of becoming versus being. Mm -hmm. um, that if we're thinking intraactively, that the focus really is on this becoming and the kind of... Uh, collectiveness the, of that versus um, this perhaps more sociolinguistic idea of unique individuals who are um, being and learning and developing. Um, and I want to prompt you to um, think about how you, well, how you as um, 
you know, after this day, uh, contributor to these fields um, for hopefully a long time, um, want to prod this or continue this discussion? Um, where do you see that there are contributions between these perspectives that can be made to each other? Or um, what direction would you like to take your future research in relation to this tension? Yeah. Thank you very much, esteemed opponent, for your compliment and also for your question, uh, which allows me to elaborate a little bit more even on the relation between ethnography, sociolinguistics, and how intra-action and uh, post-humanist notions developed by, amongst others, Barat, are contributing to this field, because this is something that I've explored also within this dissertation. And since I already spoke a little bit about the concept of intra-action, I would like to take the opportunity to also um, relate to the concept of assemblages, which I also prominently use, and take this as an example of uh, why contributing with more post-humanist notions to sociolinguistics can be fruitful. Um, so I combine the notions of assemblages and the notions of, or the, the um, analytical techniques actually, of multimodal interaction analysis in uh, different chapters. And I think that these notions and ways of thinking have actually been developed in quite different lines of thinking, but bringing them together really allows to not only focus on what is observable in the interaction or interaction, depending on which chapter we're talking about, um, but uh, to take into account what is observable. But multimodal interaction analysis so far, for example, has really um, been relying on also yeah, human actors who might, for example, perform environmentally coupled gestures, so who might also relate with materiality in a way, but it has not so much seen non-human actors. But combining these two notions of assemblages and looking at this with multimodal interaction analysis actually also allows to take into account the ideological surrounding, for example, which I have done uh, in chapter three, so for example. So it really, yeah, is a way also to enable a holistic way of looking at uh, what's happening there in these uh, practices and in these actions. And I think this actually aligns very much with the goal of sociolinguistics, which also always takes context into account. And where context also always plays a role when we are looking at the organization of speech. So I do think that these two can actually complement each other. And in my own work, I hope also in the future to keep bridging these different research traditions and uh, keep uh, engaging in the dialogue. We still have time, so we will start another round. Great. Um, <laughs> and uh, the opposition will be continued uh, by Professor Swinnon. Thank you. So my second question. Um, in the introduction, under the section child-friendly way of doing research, uh, there is an extensive and convincing description of how you secured access to the research sites and gradually introduce different ways of data collection in Little Sprouts and uh, Good Shepherd. I would like to learn a little bit more about how you parted from the children, given that you were such an important presence in their formative years. So was this parting a gradual process? Are you still in touch with the schools and the children, the teachers, etc., etc.? Yeah, thank you very much um, for your question. Um, so, of course, I kind of became a part of these uh, settings within that time. And um, I have actually just yesterday and today uh, given interviews for TV and radio together with um, yeah, also someone from the domain, uh, from the ECEC sector itself. So the connections that I made there definitely are still alive. And um, I went to visit um, the preschool uh, Little Sprouts particularly, because this is also where the data that has been collected for the, um, for the children's book uh, has been gathered. So I went there and um, attended actually a session in which the children um, or in which the teachers together with the children wet 
my own uh, children's book, uh, which then resonated very much with them because it was um, written in this setting, actually. And I will also uh, send copies of the dissertation also to um, Good Shepherd. So it uh, is always a pleasure to continue this exchange and also to, of course, bring back results from my studies to the practical field and continue the dialogue with them. Do I also have time to go back to the conversation that you already had with Professor Huff and our esteemed colleague, uh, Lauren Wagner? Yes? yes? It's about your, you already had a long explanation on the interaction versus interaction and also your use of multimodal interaction analysis. But I would like to play the devil's advocate a little bit because sometimes when I read your multimodal interaction analysis, I felt it looked a bit like more traditional conversational analysis mm -hmm. with a lot of emphasis on turn-taking between human actors. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you, is there a way of doing multimodal interaction analysis differently? Mm -hmm. Also that it looks differently and that maybe these non-human material interactors become visible in, in a different way? Yeah, thank you very much for your question. I think there's definitely something to uh, keep thinking about in the future. And it, of course, very much also depends on the type of data that you have. And this allows me also a little bit to elaborate on how I became part of the field and gradually, as you mentioned, introduce these different types of um, data collection. Because in the beginning, for example, I took only notes. Then later on, I took uh, also audio recordings. So the interaction with Daniel in the third chapter, for example, where I really prominently draw on this concept of interaction and combine it with interaction analysis. Um, that is actually based on audio recordings. And I do think that uh, using video recordings, which I did later on, again, which as linked to the ethical dimension and to the dimension of really um, establishing a good posi position in the field, getting along well with children and teachers, making sure that everyone feels conf comfortable with the way that I generate data there. So the video recordings enable much more space for also non-human actors to um, portray them more prominently to zoom in, for example, on objects which are being used and to really portray these prominently also in transcripts. And yeah, I think this is um, definitely important to do when thinking um, within concepts of interaction and how to maybe look at language in a, in a different way, which is not only happening between humans, but uh, where also non-human actors are playing a role. So that's very, a very relevant point, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Professor Hoof, uh, would you like to pose another question? Maybe I can follow up on the discussion we are having, because in um, education, or in people who engage with post-humanist and new materialist theories, there is a hesitancy towards ethnography, and hesitancy is a carefully chosen <laughs> word. You could also say they think ethnography um, doesn't work if you want to work with post-humanist and new materialist frameworks. Did you ever feel that there is an inadequacy of your methods of the ethnographic approach and what you wanted to find out. You, you, you just affirmed that um, like doing videos helped you to see more clearly, but were there hesitancies or moments when you thought, well, ethnography, the idea of the context, which you just mentioned, is not a post-humanist one. Were there clashes? Would you say there were incompatibilities? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is a very uh, interesting and tough question. <laughs> um, well, um, ethnography has also been defined as a way of seeing. And I think that as a more traditional uh, so social and cultural anthropologist in this tradition, really this way of seeing has been very much uh, trained to be a way of seeing the context and what is happening as actions in the context, actually. That's very true. Um, but I do believe, however, that when ethnography is about a way of seeing, 
then it can also be a way of seeing things differently and to incorporate that also in ethnographic vignettes. Um, so this definitely is a matter of of training and I found myself, because you're asking about clashes that I had also going through a process within this regard. In the beginning, for example, I found myself very prominent in the data that I saw. I was very visible in the notes I took, very visible in the video recordings, audio recordings. And first I found that difficult because I was thinking more from classical sociolinguistic frames of having to look at what is happening in the field, but then I actually notice this allows me to really also engage with my own entanglement in the field. So it enables a different way of seeing. And I think it's a matter of, uh, yeah, looking at what you're doing and how yourself are entangling with the field and how different things in the field are entangling. So uh, I don't see the two as contradictory, but it definitely requires ethnographic sensitivities, which might also have to differ a bit from the traditional sense of how we as anthropologists are trained as seeing specific things. So, we can continue with uh, Professor Jaspersen. Thank you, dear chair. Uh, there appears to be a dramaturgical um, organization in your um, PhD. It seems as if the children are essentially good and the teachers are pretty bad or at least uninformed. And um, this is of course related to the fact that uh, it's the teachers rather than the children who stand in the way of an appreciation of linguistic diversity. You, you state in your PhD that uh, multilingualism is a societal reality and this, is, this isn't yet reflected in schools which still operate on a monolingual habitus. Now imagine a nursery school teacher doing a, um, an internship in academia where there is also a, a lots of toddler-like uh, behavior, at least uh, sometimes, um, he or she would quickly notice that um, things in academia can be pretty monolingual too. Your PhD is in English. This PhD defense is pretty much in English. So this quite beats the wind uh, out of the reality argument. I mean, we cannot say that we have a special contact with reality that they don't have because our reality is uh, very often monolingual too. Um, so, um, I still think that, that it's useful to, to discuss language education policy. I still think that uh, researchers have a lot of uh, useful knowledge. Um, but I wonder if we can engage uh, or, or enter into dialogue with teachers um, in a way that avoids that we present them as uh, dumb or uh, uninformed. Um, so I wonder what you think of this, and, and, and in your question feel free to address either the fact that I think that there are essentially good or bad people in your uh, PhD, or to ruminate on how we can dialogue with teachers in a way that avoids, uh, a, that, avoids that we adopt a researcher knows best attitude. Yes, thank you, uh, highly esteemed opponent, for your question. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I do think um, that um, it's, of course, difficult to also take into account power dynamics, which are at stake, um, without, all, yeah, and at the same time being a bit more descriptive. Uh, so this is a real challenge within research, but I hoped to balance it a little bit more than uh, what you have portrayed within, um, within your question, because I also, in fact, uh, write about um, peers who also follow really monolingual tendencies and who uh, engage in language ideological clashes, for example. But I also um, yeah, write about just teachers' daily practices, actually, um, in a way of focusing on what, what they are actually doing and that it is also very um, usual for teachers who are having a very busy job that I really highly respect to also maybe have a little chat in the fruit break or something like this. And they are also, of course, trained to see uh, the, um, to come back to the answer that I have just given uh, to the other esteemed opponent, um, Franz Hiddink. Um, they are also trained to see education in a specific education-centered way and to look less at 
peer interaction, for example. So it is a little bit more layered than that, I would think. <laughs> but very, thank you very much for uh, this little provocation of how this relates to um, the maybe more monolingual reality that I portrayed. And I would actually also like to counter this a little bit because when we just met outside of the aula for the first time, we spoke Dutch, for example. Um, <laughs> then already um, I met my family who's here, who speaks German. So we also know that about 48% of the inhabitants of Limburg actually vitally switch between Limburgish and Dutch. And um, the child Daniel in chapter three then, for example, was also, uh, yeah, at one point when we found an interaction format that uh, allowed him to use his multilingual um, abilities, uh, was also happy to bring in his multilingual competences. So in that sense, I uh, do think that, um, yeah, it is actually, uh, especially for children who are also already, um, as I already mentioned, they are in their language development still, and um, they might also make specific choices or, yeah, if, be it deliberate or not, um, about uh, their language use. Um, it's very influential age because they're in the middle of their language acquisition, of course. So uh, I do believe that um, it's a reality that an openness for multilingualism can uh, benefit them in that sense. Dr. Hitting. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, I'm going to uh, talk a bit quickly uh, now to uh, pose my question. Uh, since you're an expert on um, ethnography, um, I need your help. Um, because in my work as practice-oriented researcher, we work a lot with teachers and professionals in primary school and preschool in so-called design research. Um, in this research and classroom activity uh, to enhance particular language practices is prototyped, tested and evaluated with our partners in several uh, subsequent, uh, subsequent cycles. Before the start of our design research, we as a researcher try to underscore the importance of qu qualitative and inductive methodologies like CA and et ethnography. However, teachers and funders often see clarity regarding potential outcomes before the start of our research. Could you provide me some arguments to help me, me persuade my colleagues, teachers and funders in the importance of such emic methodologies in practice-oriented research? What could be the added value of these me methodologies for practice-oriented research? Or do you think that, is, that it is too uh, time-consuming? Thank you very much, esteemed opponent, for your question. Uh, yeah, it is indeed, uh, I can imagine, a challenge to convince funders, but also to convince um, society partners who you're also working with of the qualities of ethnographic research, um, because ethnographic research uh, takes time. Sometimes people also find it daunting to uh, invite ethnographers in, into the settings where they are working or, um, yeah, where they are uh, spending time as children or parents also who might be reluctant to have someone that the child doesn't know, which I think is are all understandable fears and it's actually our task as ethnographers or as emic researchers to then um, use also our social skills. This is also why in one of the propositions I think that ethnography is not only requiring research skills but also social skills. So it's really about finding ways to communicate with the field which um, yeah, enable a smooth <laughs> becoming part of the field. And smooth in that sense doesn't always need to mean perfect. It's also normal that this... <laughs> can finish your thought. <laughs> yeah, there, it's, uh, I was going to say that it's also normal that there are also clashes because it's just a social reality. And um, yeah, I'm happy to continue the conversation at the reception. Right. <laughs> 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 Marie Rickert, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The Dewey Committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. <laughs> the PhD defense has now ended.
The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Hit the mileage,
dancing. Marie Rickert, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Cornips is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite uh, Professor Cornips to now take the floor. Please all rise. It works? Yes. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? To be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Marie Rickert, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. And as evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate uh, signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the, un of the committee and affixed with the official zeal of the university. Wel edel, zeer geleerde vrouwen. Dat mag ik nu zeggen. Uh, dag dokter, dag lieve Marie. Zo enorm goed gedaan. Zo enorm gefeliciteerd ben. Ja, natuurlijk. Weet je, ik, zelf ben ik helemaal, uh, helemaal enthousiast over je boek en nu je verdediging. Ik begin in het Nederlands om te laten zien wat het effect van taalkeuze is natuurlijk. En ik wil jou, uh, je partner Ezan en natuurlijk je ouders... Uh, en verdere familie zo enorm feliciteren met je proefschrift en met je inspirerende verdediging die je sprankelend, die je zojuist hebt laten zien. Uh, ik kan nauwelijks aangeven aan jullie allemaal wat voor prestatie Marie heeft neergezet als PhD-kandidaat. En ik wil je echt in de schijnwerpers zetten. Vanaf het moment dat je aan je promotietraject begon, vanaf het allereerste moment heb ik van je genoten. Vier jaar lang. Ik ga je ontzettend missen. Uh, en ik heb genoten van je ook in alle relaties, wanneer we spreken over interaction, van, van alles wat mogelijk is tussen een promotor en een promovenda. Uh, altijd constructieve feedback. Uh, luisteren naar advies van mij, maar lekker je eigen gang gaan. Uitstekende, uitstekende diplomatieke vaardigheden. Altijd een goed humeur. Zorgen voor goede, gezellige en efficiënte communicatie. Lekkere dingen voor mijn bakken tijdens de <laughs> pandemie. Uh, altijd zorgen dat alle bureaucratische verwikkelingen van Münster, van Fasels en van Limes altijd in orde waren. <laughs> um, je hebt mij geïnspireerd in mijn eigen onderzoek natuurlijk. Uh, altijd goede relaties gehad met je fellow PhD's. Met de mensen van Liems, de collega's, de Fasels, management. Je hebt geparticipeerd in zoveel activiteiten van Fasels. Uh, en ook natuurlijk in de etnografische, in de etnografie uh, werkgroep. Ik vind het jammer dat onze relatie nu afgelopen is. Maar ik hoop natuurlijk op een nieuwe doorstart op andere manieren. Dearest Marie. So now the academic stuff starts in English. <coughs> After expressing my more personal comments, 
in Dutch, I will continue with the academic Lodigio in English. Not only did you finish your successful dissertation within four years, and even this defense one month after the end of your contract, but the four articles of your dissertation also appeared in very authoritative uh, linguistic journals. I cannot express the magnitude of this achievement as a PhD candidate. You have impressed me from the moment that you started, and thanks to Sophie van Honacker, she's here, and uh, Professor Gunther de Vogela, we were able uh, to design a PhD project, your project, uh, within the European Union Horizon 2020 Research MRE Curie Grant. So, Sophie, I still have to, Thomas. and Thomas, we, we have to think limits that this proposal became possible. I'm certain that your research and diplomatic skills were of major importance in Limes as well. It's not only fossils, but also Limes that you had to spend a lot of time in Limes and you did it very well. So you uh, started your PhD project where I had to end as a social linguist N about multilingualism in preschool and you took it further uh, so it is your ethnographic research skills, your ethnographic fieldwork skills, but also your research skills that made it possible to examine the form phenomena of language choice in preschools much deeper than I had done before. I now know uh, that it's not only language choice and language mixing, but also body positioning, orientation, also the objects, the distributiveness of everything, the material and the ideological, I cannot say context anymore, <laughs> but that bring out uh, the, the mixing or the choice, so to speak. Um, you did it and, you, you, and the whole mixing becomes much more, uh, uh, you are able to account for it at much deeper levels than I had done before you started. You did this all this long-term observation within the troublesome COVID period. I know that you were living then in Belgium, the border closed. True. It was just five minutes to the university, but you couldn't make it because there was a border and it was closed. It was awful, wasn't it, yeah. that period? <laughs> and you did your field work. We were worrying so much about are you able to do your field work and you know, an ethnographer without field work is impossible to think of. Um, you built, nevertheless, the whole COVID and uh, your, your building of trust is something that characterizes a well-skilled anthropological researcher. Uh, also very reflexive about your own positioning in the field. And thanks to your commitment, your analytical writing and ethnographic skills, we are here to celebrate not only your PhD defense, but also your new postdoc position at Radboud University. So your research would not have been possible without the fin financial involvement of promoter Professor Gunther de Vogelaar. And therefore, I would like to thank him and also, of course, the third supervisor, Christine Arnold. I thank you, Gunther, for making Marie's research possible, and I'm happy. Yeah, of course, it is my pleasure to, to add a few words uh, to this as your uh, co-supervisor -sup uh, in, in Münster. Um, from my um, experience, I mean, the entire enterprise is... Uh, illustrate once again uh, how the, the Dutch-German border area really remains the rich source for all kinds of uh, intercultural experiences. Und da diese interkulturellen Erfahrungen in der Anfangsphase überwiegend administrativer Art äh, waren und die Erfahrungen äh, wohl den Klischees des bürokratischen Deutschlands und der lockeren, vielleicht sogar nach lässigen Niederlande entsprechen, kommt es mir logisch vor, diesen Teil meiner Laudatio auf Deutsch zu halten. 
Erst äh, nach langen Bemühungen ist es mir äh, gelungen, eine Lösung für einige heikle Finanzfragen zu finden, die sowohl mit den Münsteraner Ordnungen als auch mit den Limes Vorgaben kompatibel äh, war. Und auch da der Kotutelle war und ist zum Teil noch immer mit bürokratischem Aufwand verbunden. Um, a more interesting type of uh, intercultural experience has been the academic collaboration. Um, and although our supervision uh, meetings uh, were actually tri-national, uh, the more challenging aspect there has been the clash between the variety of research cultures and methods that all members of the committee brought to the table. Uh, I seem to remember that when Leonie and I as linguists well, working, as you can say, on the interface of quantitative and qualitative research, uh, decided to hire a social, social scientist with a major in anthropology to carry out the research project. The idea was actually to train said anthropologist to become more of an actual linguist. Um, although you, Marie, were really always open to suggestions from our part, uh, you did decide to remain true <laughs> to your roots as a linguistic anthropologist. And um, yeah, reading the parts of your dissertations has uh, therefore remained uh, the same kind of intercultural experience to me uh, still now, even as it was in the beginning of your project. Um, it is a magnificent piece of work, nevertheless. Um, that should be stressed. Uh, among other things, you, you have really done a great job in steering clear of all kinds of claims that more quantitatively oriented researchers could take issue with, um, which can only be done, I think, if you successfully absorb enough of the insights from uh, other angles. You really deserve to be congratulated for this, um, as this ability, as does the entire dissertation, uh, testifies to, to excellent research skills on your part, Marie. Uh, your whole traject getuigt behalve van onderzoeksvaardigheden, ook van sociale en interculturele vaardigheden aan jouw kant. Je bent erin geslaagd om de hele organisatorische kant van je promotieonderzoek tot een goed einde te brengen. En wie goed kijkt naar je video's, merkt snel hoe weinig moeite het je kost om los te komen uit de academische setting en betekenisvolle contacten aan te knopen met peuters en opvoedsters. Het mag ook nog een keer gezegd worden dat je dit alles voor elkaar hebt gekregen tijdens een pandemie die je eigenlijk ook als interculturele ervaring voor de hele wereld kan beschouwen. Je volgende academische halte is Nijmegen, um, wat eigenlijk precies even ver van Maastricht als van Münster verwijderd ligt. Ik, sp ik spreek uh, niet alleen namens mezelf, maar ook namens de collega's Nederlandische in, in Münster en zeker ook namens de collega's uh, in Maastricht, als ik de hoop uitspreek uh, dat je de komende jaren niet alleen nog af en toe uh, in Maastricht te zien zal zijn, maar zeker ook in Münster... Uh, en wij kijken alvast uit naar een volgende lunchgesprek, misschien wel bij een nog niet ontdekte bionade variant. Dear Dr. Rickert, Dr. Rickert, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I'd like to congratulate you with the degree that you have acquired. And before I bang this and declare this officially closed, there are two practical announcements. Um, immediate, the reception for everyone um, is actually not in this building, but in the Jan van Eyck Academy. If you don't know where that is, follow some of the locals. Um, the committee and the supervisors and the candidate and her paranyms will remain um, here for, to take a few photos. Um, and we will join you over at the Jan van Eyck um, in a few minutes. We will leave first, um, and then once we've gone, you can find your way over to the Jan van Eyck. But now I will declare this event uh, over. Yeah. Yeah.